Okay, folks, I um, uh, thought long and hard about including this section, but for those who are interested in practicing law, you'll, you'll learn a little bit about some of the personnel that you're likely to encounter on a regular basis. Uh, but uh, this is primarily in here to basically show you that you're going to hear a lot of things out on the street and everywhere else about, even in the, these videos about rates, billable rates, and things like that. But the purpose of this section, in addition to acquainting you with the personnel that you'll be dealing with as a lawyer uh, and the types of law firms you may be running into, uh, it's more or less to show you the level of uncertainty and complexity involved in the business model that most lawyers face. I mean, the business of practicing law is just fraught with uncertainties and inefficiencies that are very, very difficult to correct or deal with. And so when you hear numbers about billable rates and costs of doing business, uh, hopefully this video will give you some idea of why numbers are very difficult to come up with and why those numbers, even when they are arrived at, are, you know, a little bit misleading and sometimes a lot misleading. So anyway, with, uh, with that in mind, uh, here we go. Okay, so you, you know, you're, you certainly can slow down or stop the video at any point that you uh, are interested in doing so. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, I've already talked about the inefficiencies and how all the numbers about billable rates and things like that can be uh, very misleading. Uh, you know, I noticed that like down here, you know, a lot of businesses face well, they're um, competitors. Uh, you're in competition, and uh, in a sense, you can consider them to be adversaries, but they don't direct the customer is, is, or someone on the other side who has probably got a couple of graduate degrees is not consciously trying to defeat them in a case. People get angry. Litigation, for example, is inherently uncertain, so that makes and so trying to figure out a time frame for, for when things are going to end, how much they're going to cost, uh, is exceedingly difficult in a lot of circumstances. It's, it's a lot, and, and you know, in this last thing, a client tells you that your opponent's going to be a 90 pound weakling. And when you get into the ring with them, you find out you're up against the King Kong because clients are notorious. Or even when they're trying to be honest for leaving out a few crucial details and their bias to begin with. And so, and meanwhile, you have structured your financial uh, picture based uh, in part about uh, uh, what the, the clients say. And so um, it, it creates a lot of uncertainty. Um, so in any event, if you want to see that. Okay, here's the big dilemma. Um, Lawyers can't bill clients for every minute or hour that they that they spend. The problem are the inefficiencies, and this is particularly true for partners, but it's even a true true for associates, associate lawyers, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, you can't bill for things like that you spend, like on marketing for new clients. Uh, you can't spend. You can't bill for tire kicker calls. A lot of the general public expects lawyers to expect lawyers to provide free legal advice in, in ascertaining whether or not to take the case. Uh, that is a <laughs> that is a, a, an issue that I have um, very strong feelings about. But uh, in any event, um, you get a lot of people who just want free legal advice, and they take up your time. I mean, doctors don't give free medical advice. <laughs> Well, I'm sure they do sometimes, but not anywhere near as much as lawyers do. But anyway, and whether that's good or bad uh, is something I'll one day do a uh, War and Peace book on. But anyway, uh, hiring and firing employees, uh, time worrying about and collecting from slow paying clients, seminars, actually, uh, it should be, we should make that probably, uh, we'll make that. Actually, that should be its own separate number for time spent on tech issues. This is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. <clears throat> uh, mistakes. It's 
sometimes the lawyer will do something and say, oh, that was messed up, and you'll go back and you'll say, I can't really build a client for that. Uh, some portion of traveling costs probably, um, and this is a big one. If you just don't, if you're not a, like a specialist and just constantly get one type of case, uh, you spend a lot of time figuring out how you're going to build clients uh, because each client is different, has a different financial needs, different financial background, how long it's going to take for the case to resolve itself. There's a gazillion factors that go into how to bill somebody. And then they've got some cases like plaintiff's personal injury cases where you, the lawyer just gets paid if uh, there is an actual cash recovery. You can't bill for that. You, you either get paid because you recovered or you don't get paid anything. Please know and understand, because this is very important, when I talk about billable, I mean billable by the hour, where a lawyer charges by how much time he puts into something. There are other types of cases which we will talk about in a minute called contingent fee cases and flat fee cases, where a lawyer just charges a certain amount regardless of how much time he spends. Regardless of whether he spends one hour, 20 hours, 50 hours, he charges a flat fee, like it might be like 750 bucks, regardless of how much time he puts in it. Similarly, in contingent fee cases, he may only charge if he makes a collection, and how much he gets paid depends on what percentage the contingent fee is. For example, in a plaintiff's personal injury case, the contingent fees are, we'll say, 33% a third. So if there's a $100,000 recovery, the client, I mean, the lawyer gets 33% of that, which is $33,000. But if there's no recovery, regardless of how much time he put in the case, he gets $0, the lawyer does. So in both contingent fee and in flat fee cases, those are not billable cases. The, the fee arrangement is based either on a flat sum or on a contingent basis based on some percentage. Those are not billable cases. Yeah, and while I'm on it, we're talking about lawyers can't bill for every hour of the day and billing inefficiencies. Um, this is a big one right here because especially if your client base are basically people making less than a hundred grand a year. I've got 80 a year, but I'm going to say a hundred grand a year. Those types of people cannot, generally speaking, this is, isn't always the case, but generally speaking, cannot afford to pay lawyers for complex cases. These kind of people, generally speaking, have to be charged what are known as flat fees. In other words, you're not building by the hour. You just say, this is how much uh, I'm going to charge you, and then you're stuck with that. So you don't really build by the hour. It's like I'm going to charge you $500 like for a traffic case. Uh, let me put traffic case here. Uh, we can talk misdemeanor. Uh, misdemeanor. Misdemeanors. Criminal to misdemeanors. Um, these are all flat fee cases. If I charge somebody like 700 bucks to represent them on an assault and battery case, that's what I get, period, regardless of how much time I spend on it. No contest divorces where everybody's agreed or allegedly agreed to child custody, uh, what any alimony is going to be, uh, if any, uh, property division, and all that's agreed upon. No contest divorce is usually charged on a flat fee basis. You know, if I charge somebody, for example, you know, uh, I don't know, five to seven hundred bucks, say six hundred bucks for a no contest divorce, that's what I get regardless of how long the case takes. This is a huge section for small time lawyer, when I say small firm lawyers that represent the general public in close to what I would call the old fashioned general practice. So much of their time, maybe 80% of their time, is not spent charging by the hour. It's charging on these flat fee cases. And if, and, and normally the fees involved for these types of cases are less uh, than, uh, than uh, $1,000 typically. 
And so you've got to do a lot of those cases, a lot of those cases to make your numbers work out. And you've got to keep those people coming in the door like you're building Fords uh, and Henry Ford days at the turn of the century in a big factory. But that, that if you have this type of practice, you may not even have four or five billable hours a day. You may have, if you're lucky, you know, you may you may go weeks without having one billable hour. You're spending all your time on these small, typically less than one thousand dollar flat fee cases, and that's where most of America, where John Q. Citizen is, is in this area because. A person making less than $100,000 can't afford a twenty, thirty, or $40,000 legal bill. Okay, I've got to interject one of the most important things I'm going to say in all of these videos. We were talking about flat fees. Flat fee cases, this is basically the market for clients that make less than 180 to 100,000 dollars a year. We're talking even here about a lot of poor folks, especially those seeking traffic and misdemeanor, maybe even some felony representation. Um, but no contest, uh, like simple uncontested divorces, simple bankruptcies, maybe a residential real estate transaction, a simple I love you will with no tax planning. Like I said, legal fees, um, legal fees are typically less than $1,000 for these types of cases because those kind of people, middle class and lower income folks cannot afford to hire a lawyer to handle a complicated case on an hourly basis. So we, so flat fees really aren't bill, billable hourly. And so when I say not billable, I mean not billable hourly. And in a flat fee case, you're gonna get paid a set amount regardless of how long it takes you. Now, if you get a really complicated case and you're handling it on a flat fee basis and you've gotta spend, you know, 100 hours on the case and you've charged $1,000, you uh, may miss uh, your next mortgage payment. <laughs> That's all I can say because you are really behind the eight ball as a lawyer under those circumstances. So here's the really, really important point. Um, it's this flat fee market where many lawyers dwell, especially those who serve the general public, John Q's citizen. We're talking about the lower class, the middle class market. Uh, that's where the clients are. Uh, Flat fees that can be charged are driven by supply and demand. And that's very unfortunate when there are a lot of lawyers because there's a lot of supply. And when you have a lot of supply for any good or service, it drives prices down. In this case, prices are the level of fees you can charge. So the fees you can charge in this market area are low. As a matter of fact, I will tell you that my experience is, is that the flat fees for these types of cases right up here, have changed very little, if any, in the last 30 years. And one of the things, despite whatever inflation there's been, you're, you're not getting compensated for the inflation. And the reason for that is enough new lawyers are entering the marketplace that they keep those fees down, way down. Okay, we were talking about the flat fee cases. Um, this is where, you know, John Q. Citizen, you know, people who make less than $100,000 a year. And I'm talking specifically here about another important aspect of handling John Q. Citizen. I mean, uh, middle America, uh, middle class folks, poor folks, people that make less than, we'll say, eighty or $100,000 a year where legal fees are typically less than a thousand dollars, and this is particularly true in uh, things like uh, no contest divorces and traffic and misdemeanor cases. Uh, but it could it could apply in any situation where you collect fees in advance of the rendition of services, which we we do not call billable hours here, right? When you, 
here we're talking about billing something that you you collect money from this particular market from folks making less than eighty thousand dollars a year you always collect those fees up front because if you don't collect that money up front you, there's a good likelihood you will never get paid but here's the consequence of this these are low fee paying cases already right and you're only going to get a set amount no matter how much time you've spent well, under state bar rules, you have to deposit those monies that are rend that are paid in advance of the rendition of services. You have to deposit them in something called an escrow account. And you're generally speaking, um, this is kind of a complicated subject, but we'll just say that generally speaking, you have to wait till the end of the case before you can draw those monies out of that escrow account. So even though you've collected the money up front, it has to sit out on the side out of reach in this escrow account until the end of the case. That means you're not going to get paid probably for a couple months after you collected the funds. So even if your electricity is going to be cut off, even if your rent's not being paid and you desperately need the money it's supposed to sit in that escrow account, you cannot use it until services have been rendered. So in a sense, you do bill that escrow account, so to speak, but we're not talking about it that way in terms of these videos. Uh, we only talk about billable, uh, uh, billable in terms of billable hours for clients, normally richer clients, normally corporations who pay, can afford to pay you for doing legal work by the hour. Um, but this, this, all this stuff about the escrow account is you have to create a separate sex, set of books to do it. That's an extra expense of bookkeeping the delay in receipt of your funds in a area that's already got thin profit margins and a lot of times what the bar the bar associations and lawyers the rules they collectively come up with to regulate themselves are counterproductive and that's my opinion of uh, the escrow account rules. I'm not talking about a situation here where you're holding somebody else's funds to pay their bills because it really is their money. But when you're talking about um, collecting money that are prepaid fees, I think a lot of times these rules are counterproductive and maybe some of you out there will change it one day. Um, but anyway, that's a very important thing because, uh, you know, you like I said, you can spend a gazillion hours in a low profit margin area. You, you're going to get del uh, delay in getting paid. Um, and so uh, just sort of keep that in mind. Uh, so that is what I want to say. This this and you like I said, this is not the area where you can do much billing on an hourly basis. Most of the time you're going to be stuck doing flat fees. Now you can charge by the hour, but good luck collecting on it because if if you try to collect on it, a lot of times your clients will take bankruptcy, they'll get out of town, just about anything. So this is a very, very important point for somebody who wants to represent John Q. Citizen or one, you know, and this is you're usually talking about your uh, lawyers in your smaller firms, uh, maybe some mid-sized firms, uh, but you're a lot of times you're talking about new lawyers, especially are in this market unless they get hired by a major law firm or go into the government or get hired by a corporation. Um, and there are a lot of factors. So there's a lot of time during the day that a lawyer can't bill. And this is a big factor in what we're going to talk about uh, here very shortly. I'll let you just read this. But uh, what, what you find out is, is that the, the smaller your staff is, uh, like secretaries, paralegals, and things like that, then the lawyer has to spend more time during the day not billing. He's handling business matters. He's not handling the client's case. So he can't bill for that. Um, and so you, the constant rub is, is whether if you do hire people, whether that is actually going to, um, uh, whether you're actually going to be able to build more hours in the day because you've got staff handling other affairs 
And if that staff allows you to bill more hours per day, does the additional amount of income that you are generating because of your additional billable hours, does that, and plus the increase in your rate probably, uh, your fee rate, uh, does that more than offset the additional cost of the personnel? That's always a big question for lawyers. So it's a huge business question. Um, factors that affect a um, lawyer's cost of doing business. Okay, we're going to get right down to it because we're going to be discussing this a lot. Uh, and the biggest one is a firm's size and structure and its personnel. Uh, now, there are these lawyers called partners, and sometimes I call them members. They're the same thing, or associates. Partners or members only really only make money if the firm is profitable after all costs and expenses. Um, is there anything left over for profit that gets paid to the partners and to the members who are the same thing, basically? And uh, but associate lawyers are these are the guys from just out of law school, the young lawyers. Um, they get paid salaries, so they're part of overhead uh, for the partners, okay? And then, of course, you've got secretaries and paralegals. Now, in most states anymore, paralegals, you go get a separate diploma or uh, associates or a paralegal degree to become a paralegal. They are, uh, they're sort of like nurses are to doctors as paralegals are to lawyers. And then you've got a myriad of other people. An important uh, new component in the last 30 years is tech support, maybe for the last 40 years. Uh, you know, you got to keep those computers and your, uh, your intranet and your internet and everything going. And now with e-discovery and things like that, very, very important. Um, and in really large law firms, you'll have lawyers and these, sometimes they are partners. Uh, and they're uh, devoted mostly to management. Uh, and then of course, you've got your bookkeepers, your accountants, and the people in your human resources department that do recruit, recruiting and hiring. Then you've got your summer law clerks that are usually law. Personal injury case, uh, firms or litigation firms usually may have on staff private investigators. And then the job that I did when I was uh, my first year of law school, I worked for a law firm and I used to do their banking, run to the bank for them, deliver mail sometimes for them. Whatever was left over that had to be done that didn't require a lawyer, we would, uh, the runners would do it. But that's usually only for larger law firms. But anyway, okay, this is a biggie right here. Um, Marketing costs. Um, what's a big determinant of the amount of your marketing costs or who your your clients are? If it's the general public, like for personal injury cases, like for criminal and traffic cases, maybe divorce cases, or whatever. Uh, if it's John Q. Citizen, you might have to do more TV and radio advertising. If your corporate, if your clients are corporations, this is what larger law firms usually have. The way they market is um, uh, probably a little more nuanced. <clears throat> yeah, and of course, um, who your pr prospective clients are is going to uh, also have an effect on how you're going to contact them. TV, like this radio, r radio, internet, you know, various video platforms, social media platforms whether you're going to just try to rank kind of Google search or whatever, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to get into various marketing techniques, email, how are you, are you going to contact them by text? How about the old fashioned yellow pages? Uh, there's a lot of different approaches, but who your clients are going to very much affect which one of these you're going to use. Um, yeah, marketing costs. Um, and I'll tell you, a hidden one is what I call your tire kickers, those who just want free legal advice that call you up on the phone. They talk to you for 5, 10, 15 minutes, and you don't get any fees out of them or anything like that. So that's the lawyer's time, and it's inefficient, and it's a hidden cost for the law firm. Oh, yes. 
And in what kind of law practice do you get the most tire kickers? It's in the practice that handles a lot of flat fee cases. You get a lot of phone calls from folks trying to get free legal advice because they can't afford attorneys. And so you spend a lot of time and they're calling to try to get the best flat fee price from numerous lawyers. So tire kickers are very associated with lawyers that do a lot of flat fee cases, unfortunately. Yeah, and I was talking about tire kickers uh, and uh, you know, folks who just call and don't seem to want to hire a lawyer, they just want free legal advice. And I said that was a particular problem with these flat fee cases, which are low margin cases, because legal, typically the legal fees are less than $1,000. And then this marketing guru comes on and says, for at least 50% of the legal market, potential more than 50% of potential clients require at least five contacts um, before they will hire, hire a lawyer, five contacts. Well, think about the time uh, involved in hiring and in, in chasing that particular type of client. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but margins in these types of cases, the profit margins are very tight to begin with. And you're going to really squeeze those margins if you're going to spend all this time dealing with those folks. So uh, anyway, it's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, marketing uh, cost benefit analysis, analysis type of problem. Uh, another biggest, big one that affects marketing costs is how big is the firm's overhead to begin with. The larger your overhead is, uh, generally speaking, in order to cover that overhead, you're going to have to spend more and more on marketing. So it's sort of a cause effect, uh, what's the word there? Uh, symbiotic relationship, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, they go hand in hand. The size of the firm is also going to be dependent, uh, going to have an effect on its marketing costs. Okay. Uh, lawyers and firms must have a healthy and realistic critical balance between marketing costs on the one hand and the firm's ability to handle cases generated uh, on the other. Um, on the flip side, a firm that goes cheap and tries to reduce costs spent wisely on marketing will find itself with less revenue because not enough uh, less revenue and uh, become uh, a loss situation. It's likely. So, you know, if you don't do enough advertising, enough, uh, enough business isn't walking in the door, you're going to have an operating loss, which a firm can't do very long, uh, be out of business. Technology is an increasingly important issue. And, and one of the big ones, reasons why it is, is the security risk. Law firms have a lot of private type of data, and that makes them a real target for hackers. Uh, and so technology and safety, uh, protecting against security risk. There are so many but ramifications to all this. And if you're, you know, your, your technology, uh, uh, technological assistance breaks down, you may have to have business interruptions, uh, and you've got to hire personnel um, to maintain this stuff. And, uh, you know, they are professionals, and that's a separate field of profession professionalism uh, there, and they, that cost can add significantly. Uh, and it's, like I said, it's just a vital part of any law practice nowadays. Okay, office space, where is huge? In major metropolitan areas, particularly the major cities, uh, your, it'll affect hugely by multiples your costs and the fees you can expect to charge. Um, here's another one on office space. What, and this, in, in the age of the internet and technology and online legal research, it really makes this kind of a, uh, a, a fluctuating sort of field right now. I am so old fashioned that I still 
prefer books to internet related research for one very simple reason. I, I still think that legal research online is gives one a sort of a myopic perspective of what's out there. I, I feel like I'm doing my research in a tunnel. Uh, I, I like the ability when I do it with books to be able to quickly look back and forth, uh, page back and forth. Uh, I, I, I still am, I still think that, uh, you know, provided I don't have to walk, you know, 200 yards to find the freaking book in question, uh, I still like um, books. But if you do books, you're going to have a lot of space requirements and books are heavy and you have to update those subscriptions because laws change, new case law comes out and the subscription expenses for your law library can be, you know, not cheap, not cheap at all. Um, parking and costs, therefore, of course, that's dependent on location. Okay, with all apologies to accountants, we're going to use the word costs and expenses interchangeably. Accountants out there might go ballistic over all this, but in terms of the general public, when we say costs, we mean expenses and vice versa. Uh, we'll use the terms partner and mem member interchangeably. Um, you got to remember the partners and members are business owners and only make money if the firm is profitable, while associate attorneys get salaries and they are part of overhead that the partner members must pay before they can pay themselves a profit. Um, now we're going to make some videos on costs and expenses, but, we're, but for simplicity, we're going to uh, make some assumptions. Number one, that we're not talking about people who work directly for a corporation or for the government, state or local or federal. Uh, we will assume that you're either a sole practitioner or a lawyer working for a relatively small firm or is office sharing. In other words, um, we're not going to talk about associate lawyers and we're, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're going to assume that this lawyer has no paralegals, no law clerks, no runners or other personnel, just a lawyer and perhaps he's share, sharing, sharing a secretary with at least one or maybe two other lawyers and that the secretary does all, uh, answers all the phone calls uh, and the lawyer takes care of all of his tech issues. That's, that's in, <laughs> the lawyer is going to take care of all of his tech issues, okay? Okay, this scenario reduces cost to the largest extent possible. So in virtually every other case, particularly for large firms in larger cities, the partner lawyer's costs will be much, 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 much greater than what we're going to talk about. So in a sense, we're, we're sort of assuming you're going to come out of law school and, and either go out by yourself or share office space and share one secretary, in essence, and do all your own computer and tech support stuff. Okay, we don't want this video to run too long, which if we went on it, it would be too long. So we are going to split it in two. Uh, we are going to get more in uh, in the next video. We're going to get more into the actual some actual figures and try to explain them. Um, so uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Oh, please uh, like us. And also, we do have a donation page on our website. Uh, so if you do want to donate, uh, that would be appreciated appreciate it as well. It takes a lot of time, effort, and energy to do these. So uh, thanks for watching.